Hey everybody, welcome back to Reach Our Reptiles. My name is Garrett Hartle and today we are going to take an in-depth look at the favorite child of reticulated python morphs, the golden child. Alright, so today to help me demonstrate, we have Goldilocks here. She is a two and a half year old super dwarf golden child with a couple extra genes in there just for fun. But whatever you can see is that golden child gene that we're gonna be talking about today. Okay, so this is what a golden child looks like. It's basically somewhere between a, a patternless, partially patternless, or melanistic, partially melanistic kind of appearance. You have an animal that is much darker than normal, and what they're famous for because of that, you know, reticulated pythons have a crazy amount of iridescence in their skin. That is, light refracts and breaks up and, and bounces back with a rainbow over them. So they almost look like an oil slick. Because golden childs are much darker than normal, you have that dark base that that light just bounces off of. So they're famous for that rainbow appearance. But more than that, what it does is it, it reduces the pattern and kind of takes over. This is probably one of the strongest visually impacting dominant mutations that we have. A dominant mutation would mean that when I breed this golden child to a normal, half the babies come out looking golden child, even if that normal was completely unrelated. There doesn't have to be any golden child on the other parent's side. Just one of them will make half clutches. When you breed golden child to golden child, you can make a homozygous golden child, an animal which, when bred to a normal, would produce all golden childs, but it doesn't look any different or not significantly different from this heterozygous golden child. That's why you would call it a dominant mutation. Now, there is some variety in the golden child's appearance, but one thing that you're gonna notice on each one of these is that the head stamp or the patterning on the head increases, it thickens up the black line. So you end up with these kind of like Maltese crosses oftentimes in that head pattern. That's one really neat trait. As the pattern is completely erased on this individual, she basically has no pattern whatsoever on her neck. And then further down the body, you can see a little bit of those side rosettes trying to poke through that patternlessness and where you would normally see the saddles or diamond or net-like shape that reticulated pythons are, are famous for, here you just have a general spread out of speckling. Now, because this mutation affects the entire body from the tip of the nose to the end of the tail, and because it erases a lot of other pattern cues that are happening, leaving very little behind, it ends up being one of one of the most dramatic and dominant mutations that is, meaning there are no combos where you can say, I don't know, is there golden child in that or not? If there's golden child in it, you're gonna know it. You might have a hard time identifying other patterns and combinations within the trait because the golden child tends to take over in that physical appearance. So once you kind of understand what it is that that golden child genetic trait is doing, you can kind of take a look and see how it does or doesn't change in combination with other genes. Let's take a look at some of these. All right, so this is a golden child tiger. Where the other animal had just random speckling, the tiger starts to come through and pull and arrange those speckles into some stripes. So you can see, usually you get this little, especially with the dwarf and super dwarf, you'll get a little bit of that dorsal stripe, a black line right down the center of the back, and a couple stripes on the side, almost like a tri-stripe individual. Now, in animals where the golden child expresses itself very intensely, you end up with an animal like this that pretty much looks like a golden child. It has a little bit different pattern. One thing I do notice on the golden child tigers is it uh, makes a clean band from the white belly up to the, the darker top. So that's really neat to look at. But if you have what I would consider a lower expression golden child, um, those are a little bit harder to find, but a golden child that still allows, you know, for some other morphs to come through in a really exceptional example, you can actually end up with a golden child tiger that looks more like this. This is probably the most extreme 
golden child tiger that we have ever produced. And because it's such a, a low expression golden child, meaning that golden child trait is leaving quite a bit of pattern behind, what is left was, was severely affected by that tiger gene. And you can see that intense tri-stripe animal with that thick black line. You can still see the bold, <laughs> you can still see the bold head on her, um, that stripe, but the tiger reduces the pattern and you lose those crossbars and it doesn't quite connect all the way down on the nose. That's a common trait of tigers. But this being a low expression golden child, sometimes uh, are the best or the most interesting when in combination with other traits, because otherwise it just pretty much looks like a golden child. Okay, now golden child as a pattern mutation added to sunfire is actually gonna do a few other things. Now the sunfire gene traditionally increases the amount of orange and it sort of blends the look over the animal. So where that golden child tiger had that crisp line from belly up to the top, this one's much more of a blend or a faded line. And you can see the really beautiful, pleasant, kind of orangey colors on the base there. And it does clean up the speckling a little bit, meaning a little bit less speckles than the typical golden child. Um, and kind of arranged towards the top, almost nothing on the sides. So there's a lot of color packed into this snake uh, that is sometimes masked by all the darkness brought in by the golden child. So when you have these, you can see here, it doesn't reduce the head stamp as much as the tiger did. You still have got the crossbars there, the nice inky black head stamp. But this is an animal that if you can start reducing some of the melanin and leave that, uh, that pigment distribution throughout the animal that the golden child gives you, you can really have some pretty phenomenal results. But as it is, golden child and sunfire together, it's a little bit less speckly brown snake, perhaps with a few little oranges in there. Now, anery is a recessive trait. You can watch a whole video about anery right here. But this would actually be an anery golden child tiger. So again, you can see that dorsal stripe is reduced on the head. It doesn't have the crossbars and it's missing a little bit on the nose there. But then as the speckles come down the body, they're gonna break up into some stripes. This is one fun thing with Golden Child. You can see a small example of paradoxism right here. And uh, normally you would have a big splotch of brown, but this also has that anery mutation that kind of removes the brown pigment. And so this animal is like a dark charcoal gray. The tones on these snakes are more uh, in the cooler temperatures like blues and greens. They don't even refract as much red light when they make those rainbows as a normal golden child or golden child tiger would do. But all the other traits come through just so you can see that's that solid white line with the little stripe on the belly that the golden child tigers have, the pattern down the back and you can see that in anery as well. Now, one interesting pattern mutation that bred into the golden child is motley, where typically motley cleans up the pattern a bit and makes bullseye patterns down the back. Motley together with golden child, for whatever reason, uh, kind of teams up with the patternless, you know, mel melanistic nature of the golden child, and the motley golden child gets a double dose of melanin and patternless throughout its body. So if you notice the head stamp of the Motley Golden Child, it not only does it have the complete stripe and the crossbars, but it has extra speckling, these giant kind of beauty marks throughout, and the general thickness of that head stamp is doubled. Then going down the body, you really don't see any speckling except where you might have a little bit of paradoxing. It's just a, a clean black snake. Now, if you look closely, it's actually a, a very, very dark brown black, basically like uh, kind of like a black coffee is the way I would say it. And if you were to add anery to this animal, you would get uh, almost more like a blue black animal. Let's show you one of those right now. So here would be the anery motley golden child. Now, similar to the Molly Golden Child, it's a very dark black animal. Some of the paradoxing spots on this, you can really see where the anery shines. These are spots that are typically orange on a Golden Child or a Motley Golden Child, and here it's just white. The head stamp 
is still going to be the thick, heavy cross with the crossbars, extra freckles. On these animals, though, you can see those chrome colored eyes that the anneries are typical. The lips, everything is white. And then the body of this animal is a deep, uh, dark, bluish black. Even again, the reflections of the rainbow coming off of this animal are blue and green rather than reflecting that red spectrum of light that your typical animal would do. So this is about as dark as a motley golden child can get. Um, and then the interesting thing is if you start combining some of these genes together, you'll actually start to go the other direction where you begin to lighten again. I'll show you what I mean right here. So now this animal here is Motley Golden Child. You can see those heavy head stamps and crossbars, but it has an additional color enhancing gene, which is platinum, and that lightens it up a little bit. So what you end up with is a dark, almost like a tan kind of an animal with the Motley Golden Child Platinum. And platinum is a gene, you can watch a whole video on it here, that continues to lighten and brighten with age. And sometimes these platinum Motley Golden Childs, they end up having like a dark outline around each scale with a lighter center. But you can see somewhat like the Sunfire Golden Child, you have a blend from the belly, not a hard line. This animal is does not have that tiger gene in it. And you can see instead of white lips, you've got kind of the yellowy and orangish lips. Now, we actually played with uh, the platinum gene because Motley Golden Child typically makes basically an all black snake. And a super platinum is an ultra ivory, which is basically an all white snake with a little bit of black flecking. We actually produced an ultra ivory Motley Golden Child and the animal came out looking like a silver white animal with almost a carbon fiber pattern going down the back. So that was a very unique bloodline, the unique morph that we were able to produce using a combination just like this. So some of these Motley Golden Child Platinums, they will make Motley Golden Childs bred to a normal, but if you breed it into something like a Platinum, you can really start to layer in some pretty interesting results. Now to continue on even further, this animal is Motley and Golden Child with that Platinum and Sunfire. So again, you have a four gene snake, each of them doing different things. You can tell the fishnet from the platinum, that orange coming up the sides from the sunfire, the motley and the golden child working together to have a heavy head stamp with lots of crosses. And that golden child still coming through so dominantly that I think to a beginner, this would just be like a golden child. You almost wouldn't be able to identify any of the other genetic traits in that animal that separates a four gene animal from that single gene golden child. So when you're working with other pattern mutations, that golden child really tends to take over and just dominate anything else that it's working with. The caveat to this would be other color combinations that completely remove any melanin that that golden child is adding. And that is where you can get some of the most spectacular animals out of golden child breedings. Enter the albinos, probably one of the most visually stunning reticulated python combos we have ever seen is that golden child which spreads the pigment throughout the body, ending in this brilliant orange animal with minimal pattern going down the back and the pattern that is there is expressed in whatever strain of albino you have. So if it's a white albino, you would get whites. If it's a purple albino, you would get purples or in this example, a lavender albino. If you want to see how that albino gene complex works, you can watch this video right here. This animal in particular has an interesting trait. Many golden childs are clean, vibrant orange from head to tail, but some of them on animals that would be probably a darker or more melanistic golden child get what is kind of a nickname referred to in the, in the hobby sometimes as a fader tail. I can see a lot of lavender colors coming out in the tail of this animal. That is something that can increase as it grows. So just as many golden childs tend to get a little bit darker with age and motley golden childs go from very dark brown to almost solid black, 
these albino golden childs occasionally will have that albino color trait moving its way up the tail. And I've seen animals that are almost, as adults, a completely purple, lavender, or white snake with just small remnants of yellow and, and orange throughout the body. Now again, you can play with that albino gene because you have the golden child making the different pattern. You can now throw a whole slew of albinos into this um, and make things, for example, like a snow, which would be adding the anery gene to this and changing all of that reddish orange pigment into either a highlighter yellow or sometimes even a bone white, like this guy. This is a snow golden child. So again, you have that golden child pattern throughout the body, but instead of that orange, that vibrant reddish orange, you have the anery gene removing all of that. And in the case of this high colored animal, you actually end up with this highlighter yellow, almost towards that shade of green. With that fader tail, you can see those pale purples coming through on the back. And these, the animals that have more of that up their body are the ones that end up being almost a bone white color. Again, you can add more layers onto this because just as this is a purple albino with the anery gene, you have allelic traits like Mochino that can take it another level higher. Okay, so this is the Snow Mochino Golden Child. We lovingly refer to this guy as the Zombie Snow. And the Mochino is a very, very dark strain of albino that almost acts like a half tone, if you will, between those vibrant albino golden childs and the darker non-albino golden childs we saw earlier. Some of the areas where that bone white exists in the Snow Golden Childs and albino golden childs, on this guy is a deep, purple and green, we said it's basically like a necrotic flesh. Um, and that's where we got the nickname the zombie snow for this guy. But you can see he has those white anery looking eyes, the extreme dark contrast of the Mochino and all kinds of crazy greens and purples that continue to become more and more vibrant as this animal grows. Still with that beautiful rainbow iridescence and just some very strange and unnatural tones going on. This is about as far as we have gotten with the golden child combos to this point in the industry. The history of the golden child is surrounded in a little bit of controversy. I think the number one misconception that I hear all the time is that a golden child retic means it is a dwarf retic. In actuality, there are very few dwarf and super dwarf golden childs out there compared to the number of them that are actually advertised or understood as dwarf and super dwarf. To fully understand where they actually originated from, we actually talked with the originator of the gene, which is Kevin McCurley at Nerd, and took a look at some of the offspring from the very first imported golden child that ever existed. Here's a, a Solaire, that's my that's an original f***ing snake um, that I made when I when I imported the Golden Child. Yeah. I imported uh, some Solaires and then I bred the Golden Child to the Solaire and then made, I made offspring and this is one of the offspring of that. That's pretty cool. Now, because the, the dwarf sizes come from specific island localities, you know that you have to have that locality in there in order to call it a dwarf. There's a lot of people that like to argue whether or not that original golden child was from the Slayer Island, which is a dwarf island, and that's what Kevin says. But the actual you know, practicality of this is that it really doesn't matter if he was or not. Most of the golden childs out there are multi-generation bred. So if he was a pure dwarf, that first generation of breedings from that original animal would have been 50% dwarf uh, or 100% in the case where Kevin bred it to a pure slayer. 
the next generation after the 50 percenters would only be 25%, and that's below that 50% locality minimum cutoff to call anything a dwarf. Most of the genetic uh, combinations that you see in golden childs, and even a lot of the normal ones, are fourth, fifth generation bred. Now, they would have so little dwarf if that original animal was a slayer, uh, that it would not be significant in the size of the offspring anymore. Now, going into further, even the super dwarf, which would be typically you're using the localities of, you know, uh, Kalatoa or Madu or Karampa. Because those localities are so rare, they produce smaller clutches and fewer animals, the actual number of super dwarf golden childs is exceedingly low. We have people ask us all the time for high percentage super dwarf golden childs. And the truth of the matter is, I think I've probably only produced one or two clutches with anything over 50% super dwarf. Even the 50% super dwarfs like this two and a half year old female here are, are quite rare. So while that means that availability in the smallest sizes like this girl are extremely limited and probably pretty expensive now, which is a little bit of a bummer, the exciting thing is you could be a part of the history of this golden child story. That is to say there's so much work to be done with an animal that's this dramatic in appearance that can every generation be continually reduced in size, breeding back to pure super dwarfs. Well, I know that that was very comprehensive, and if you stuck around till this point in the video, congratulations to you. You're now a golden child expert. Uh, if you want to go back and watch all those info cards and learn more about all the different morphs, you can do that. Or if you just want to hang out with me and my buddy Kevin McCurley, you can watch that on this video right here. See a bunch of his original stock stuff? Where? There? Right there. I'm trying to make a box in a heart, but I'm failing at both successfully. <laughs> Thanks, guys. We'll catch you next time.